I'm Tim, he's Brian, welcome to Watchbox, and thank you for logging on. We are the team with the theme. Everything you see here on the table is from our inventory and for sale. Reach out to team also at thewatchbox.com to buy and to try. Brian, what have you got first? So we're gonna start with a bang. We've got the Patek Philippe 5961A with a black dial. Originally launched in 2006, the 5960 was Patek Philippe's first annual calendar chronograph complication. Here we have what is not the last 5960, but the last of the 5961As, the 1A representing that the watch is in stainless steel. The black dial being the rarest variant of the two. You know, you see far more of the white dials, but the black dial is a rare beast. Coming in at 40 and a half millimeters, for me, Paddock executed this watch perfectly. You know, one of the nuanced features that I really like is the black aperture windows. Really blends in nicely with the dial, as opposed to having white windows where it would have been a much starker contrast. Just, for me, the perfect watch, a blend of both, call it sport and elegance, it's probably my favorite watch on the table. This really is the perfect Patek Philippe sports watch. Uh, all things considered, I think the pricing on the market for these is very reasonable. This watch was built for less than one model year. We saw it in 2017 for just a flash of time before it was discontinued at the end. So it probably had about an eight month run in production. Think about that. A stainless steel, full bracelet, complicated Patek Philippe sports watch that ran for less than one year. Now it's 40.5 millimeters as Brian mentions. And you gotta admit that the watch wears beautifully on any wrist size because it's just not overpowering in size despite being overpowering in complications. It looks really good and truth be told this bracelet which is a handsome small link five link design vents better than that of the Aquanaut or the Nautilus. It also has more of a fluid form as you can see there's some taper to the lugs down and around the wrist so if you're borderline and I'd say borderline for this watch is about a 13 and a half centimeter circumference wrist it's going to look good on your wrist. Now the few things were done to create the 5960 1A in the most notable was the creation of a dial that was less ornate than the dress watch equivalent and better loomed. The hands are larger, the loom plots are larger, everything about it is a little bit less, shall we say, a feat than the conventional precious metal version. The black dial is a matte black, which is a very different look than the dominant lacquered black that we find throughout the watch industry. And it's anti-reflective, which plays beautifully against the metallic silver tones of the registers. Now there's a mono counter down at six o'clock. You've got your hours and your minutes down at six. You've got your chronograph seconds. The watch is a flyback, automatic winding, 55 hour power reserve, and there's a power reserve indicator up at 12 o'clock. While the watch doesn't have conventional hacking seconds, due to the vertical clutch, you can run the chronograph full time, just set the time and then reset the chronograph and use the seconds hand effectively as your zero reset seconds. Annual calendar, one adjustment per year, very friendly. An everyday wearable sports watch and complication from Patek, guaranteed from the factory. Let me see if I can get a little bit more light on this movement right here. It's not the easiest thing to capture on a bracelet, but the movement is the 28520 automatic winding column wheel vertical clutch anti-magnetic six position adjustment and free sprung. Beautifully executed. It's also fairly thin for what it is and it was Patek's first automatic chronograph caliber back in 2006. So this is a real special piece and not one that we often have in stock. We've almost always got a broad array of Nautilus. This is an occasional timepiece even for us. I like that. Good choice, Dan. Thank you. I don't know how I'm going to live up to that, but I got another Patek that's going to vie with it. You're like, I don't know how I'm going to live up to that, but... Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to start out. Brian jumps right out of the gate with his strongest option. I'm going to pull out my third string quarterback. And I have to say, even this one is an all-star. A pro bowler, to be sure. The Zin U2. It's got the size of a lineman. 44 millimeters in U-boat steel. Conventional stainless steel is going to have a Vickers rating in the 200s. U-boat steel, which is quite literally the steel used by Bowman Voss shipyards, it's about 300 to 400 Vickers. And then the bezel is U-boat steel that's been treated to a tegament process. So this is over 1,200 Vickers. And I can tell you from my own EZM 1.1 that the tegament stuff works. I've whacked it against door frames, doorknobs, car seatbelt buckles, drywall, even brick, and it hasn't scratched. 
So you're getting that on the contact point of this watch. Now it's a captive bezel, which means it's fixed to the case using screws. And you can see that right there. You can also see SUG. That's a company that is owned by Zen that builds its cases. It also makes precious metal cases for Langa. And you can see the whole thing is media blasted for a nice matte finish that looks very much like the EZM1. The watch is technically known as the EZM5. So while it's the U2 GMT, it's also the EZM5, which means it has one more year than a standard Zen warranty. So three. The timepiece is extraordinarily water resistant. You can see on the reverse side, the U2 U-boat style, 2000 meters, and it includes other Zin technologies like resistance to temperatures as low as 45 degrees Celsius and as high as 80, which corresponds to minus 49 Fahrenheit and plus 176 Fahrenheit. So it's tough stuff. There is a second time zone hand that moves in 24 hour sweeps. And then if you look very carefully, you can see the little copper sulfate capsule placed at the base of the dial. This one's inside the case rather than semi-external like a conventional Zin. That little sulfate capsule will suck the moisture out of the watch should any intrusion take place. And as Brian mentioned, it is awfully nice when a calendar disc is the same color as the dial. Throw it on the wrist, it really doesn't wear like a 44. If you'd asked me to guess, I would have said 42, maybe a 43. It's not a huge watch. So while it uses U-boat style, it's anything but a missile sub on your wrist. And it's not even that thick. By the way, these Zin straps, I don't know how they make these things, but even when they're fresh, they are absolute melted butter in the hand. So silky. I love that piece. I, I need to push this one away because it's too close to my heart and I need some physical distance. For a second I thought that you, were, you had your watch as one of your picks. Yeah, well, I've already sold this one to myself and it's going to become a collection if I go for two. Uh, but again, let's talk about your watches so I can put my mind at ease. So let's move on to the IWC. So here we have a 3714. You know, my favorite configuration of the watch, the Panda dial. So you've got, call it off-white subdials with a you know, blacked out in the background, Arabic numerals, uh, you know, that you wouldn't normally find on a Portuguese chronograph. So the Portuguese chronograph is the best selling Portuguese of all time. As I mentioned, this is my favorite iteration of the watch. It's an automatic chronograph. It's probably, I would say, globally their most recognizable watch along with the Pilot series. Without a doubt. When did they first launch the Portuguese chrono in its current iteration? In its current iteration, it came out for the 1998 model year was introduced in 1997 for the 1998 model year. And you gave me an interesting fact right before the show, which I think is really important that there have been, is it right, over three dozen versions of the watch? That's correct. The dash number at the end of the root reference 3714 just goes up and up and up and you get everything from boutique exclusives to the Boris Becker and everything in between. So this is actually 04, meaning that this is, you know, apparently the fourth iteration of the watch. And for me, as I'd said two times already, it's my, it's my favorite configuration. You know, for a long period of time, you could have purchased the watch with a silver dial with blue Arabic numerals or a silver dial with rose Arabic numerals. Those are probably the most readily identifiable examples of the watch. And then you get configurations like this, which a lot of consumers don't really know about, but are really cool. They're out there and it, they're good values. It is a fantastic watch. Most Portuguese timepieces are very large and it's difficult if you love the Portuguese but you don't want to wear a 42 and up to find the right match without wearing something like the Klein Portuguese. But this watch at under 41 millimeters is an awesome size for any wrist. You can also see that the lugs are rather sharply tapered and stubby so this is a good fit for a smaller wrist while still retaining the Portuguese lines. Now we talked a little bit last time, if we can get a little bit closer here. To the crown, you could see the old school IWC fish crown as this Dash 4 model was one of the first introduced and well into production by the late 1990s. So it bears some elements of the early IWC 3714 case construction. This would later be succeeded by the Probus Scafusia crown. On the dial side, you could see it's vertically stacked registers, constant seconds, and then you've got chronograph minutes. Fundamentally, this is a no-date Valju 7750, but back in the day, before ETA stopped delivering knockdown kits and a Bausch, IWC would basically make the movement its own with their own power source, special finishing, 
five position adjustment, their own regulator and balance, all of this would be upgraded to IWC spec, meaning that the movement effectively became something like their own. And that's something that ended when ETA stopped delivering knockdown kits in the 2000s. IWC wasn't able to make as many changes. On these early Portuguese chronos, you get what is very much an IWC movement inside an IWC case. You have lovely vintage style pump pushers. You have raised and relieved Arabic numerals vertically oriented, that panda dial, You've got hands, leaf style, like the original Portuguese reference 325. And then there's a well-chosen rayhot that slopes down from the almost barely there bezel. It's like a silver halo. And you can see that the bezel itself extends from the root of the case to flare out and add a bit of visual size without adding any actual diameter on the wrist. So this is a really cool piece. And right along with the Mark series of pilot's watches, this is the heart and soul of IWC. What would you say your favorite version of the watch is? Easily the Boris Becker, because it's all green. I'm not necessarily a Boris Becker fan, but I am very much a fan of green watches. I'm surprised, you know, when you think about that, you had mentioned that the watch launched in 1996, that it took until only the last several years for them to transition to sapphire crystal case specs. Well, you know, it's difficult to give up an addictive drug, and profits <laughs> are an addictive drug. You know, we've seen the same basic Daytona since 2000s with some aesthetic changes, but it's the same basic six digit reference. This watch continued right up until, I mean, just in the past year, we finally saw the Jubilee in-house caliber version, the 3716, mm -hmm. start filtering out to the rest of the catalog and replacing this original 3714. So a top selling watch basically needs no help. An occasional variation in metal and dial and hands, a special edition. That watch was a winner from the very beginning, and it's important to remember that the Portuguese only really came back into production in the 90s. Between 1939 and the original reference 325 and 1993, and the arrival of the Jubilee Portuguese, only about 600 Portuguesers were made over all those decades. So the 90s was a resurrection period for the Portuguese. Mm -hmm. You had the Jubilee model, you had the chronograph automatic, you had the minute repeater, and it was really just a comeback for a watch that had always been associated with IWC, but very scarcely made. Yeah, and, and this particular model really helped not just IWC, but the category of casual dress. Yeah. So, you know, you for a long time you had either sport watches or you had dress watches, and there was not as much in between. And IWC, number one, became a major value proposition if you wanted to purchase a watch in that three to $7,000 price point. But the Portuguese in particular was that value proposition if you wanted something that was a casual dress watch that you could wear all the time. And then you started seeing a lot of other brands really enter into that space. Uh, definitely, and I think it's also important to note that there was a bit of a sales pitch at the time, and that is one of the watches, due to its success, its runaway success, that helped to sell IWC to Richemont. So in a very real sense, the roots of the modern IWC lie in that watch and its sales success. Cool. Okay, so we've got, we did the Zin. Let's talk about another watch with an even harder case than U-Boat Steel, and it is a hard case. This is the AMVOX 3, the Jaeger LeCoultre AMVOX 3, the third watch created in conjunction with Aston Martin, a partnership that ran 10 years from 2004 to 2014. This was the third watch in the series, a line, not elaborations of existing watches, but unique models built to celebrate the long-term relationship that is 1920s to 1990s between Jaeger dashboard instruments and Aston Martin cars. So this is real history right here, and it's a little bit of a, a melding of JLC and Jaeger history as you have a dial that includes some elements, the hands, the numerals, uh, the specific typeface used for the numerals, that actually harks back to the Polaris of 68. You can see there are actually Polaris 68 lines to the case, as well as the box section of the sapphire. That's designed to evoke the Polaris 68. But other elements, like the fact that the numerals are radially arrayed, the bottom is open, there's no calibration across the base of the dial, there is a crown that's designed to look like an automotive gas cap, and if you look at the center, you can see there's a little bit of Aston Martin branding on this dial as well as on this case back. So you've got a little bit of an Aston Martin dashboard clock tachometer 
or speedometer, and then you've got that Polaris design DNA, and there's a grid outboard under the hour track that's designed to evoke the grills of David Brown era Aston Martins. Now, the watch is both a GMT and a tourbillon, and it is a limited edition with primarily ceramic construction, although the metal hardware is all in platinum on this model. 300 pieces were made, as you see right here. Note that the date jumps from the 31st all the way across the tourbillon aperture to the 1st, and that is designed to ensure that the date indicator doesn't obscure the tourbillon. It is a discreet tourbillon as it sits underneath a black polished bridge that's not entirely forthcoming with this refinement. So as tourbillon watches go, this one's actually kind of subtle. Now there is that second time zone. You can see there's a stump time zone there and then there's a sapphire disc that displays AM or PM. So you have a date, a tourbillon, and a second time zone with AM, PM. Turn it all over and this movement adopts quite a bit of technology from the Extreme Lab 1. The Extreme Lab 1 was a 2007 concept watch. They never built more than three to five a year, and it included elements such as the carbon fiber rotor with the platinum iridium mass. Combined with unidirectional winding and a ceramic rotor bearing, this is a very efficient winding watch. This might be the most efficient winding watch of all time. You can also see that there's a combination of ruthenium coat and rhodium coat to the bridges to add a little bit of a contrast. And then you can see engine turning as well as Cote de Genève. So this is a machine aesthetic. It's based on the same basic 978 that's found in the Master Tourbillon, which means it's also a chronometry trial winner as a version of this movement was able to achieve deviation of less than 50 seconds per year when regulated by JLC for the 2009 Concorde chronometry. This is a champion engine worthy of an Aston Martin watch. Throw it on the wrist, it's easy to wear. I own the Mbox 2 and this one actually wears just like that. It's under 50 millimeters lug to lug, which means it's a good fit for a smaller wrist and I do have a smaller wrist at 16 centimeters. It's not super light because of the use of the platinum hardware, nor is it super thick though. You'll be able to fit underneath a jacket. They use lovely and lush Bridge of Weir leather, just as you'd find in an Aston Martin interior. And then you can see that there's a contrasting stitch and it's bound to a textile substrate. So this is a very elaborate, very thick and premium strap. It's also got a deployant clasp in white gold because swing arms made in white gold are harder and stronger than in platinum. So this watch is very, very cool. Carbon, sapphire, ceramic, and platinum all built around a complication evocative of the best of 20th century driving environments. Good piece. That's why they pay me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> JLC, call me. Okay, let's talk about Zenith. Um, let's, talk, let's talk about Zenith. Um, so, <laughs> so let's talk about Zenith. So here we have the Type 20 with the Elite Premier movement. For me, I brought this watch out because it's not what immediately comes to mind when you think of Zenith, but they have made major forays into the pilot watch line, and I really do think that it's become one of their more dominant categories. Here the watch is featured in bronze with a bright blue dial, new buck blue strap. I picked it A because it fit me really nicely. I'm a fan of bronze watches. I think that Zenith got into bronze watches before it became a fad. And a lot of other brands probably, you know, piled on. The watch just fits exceptionally well. It comes in at a good price point. It's visually appealing. And, you know, Zenith's producing high quality watches at good value with really nice in-house movements. And I think that there's not a, you know, there's not a bad feature on the watch. It's pretty straightforward in what it, you know, what it's trying to be. Now, this is a fun watch because it pays tribute to the original aviation soiree of Zenith Beck. I want to say it was like 1909, but it was in the 1910s in the flight of the Louis Blériot monoplane, which is what you see right here. And French aviator Louis Blériot flew it over the English Channel, and he did so with a Zenith watch. Not a wristwatch, but a Zenith watch on board. And so you can see this is the Montre de Ronef Type 20, and later on Zenith would also have an array of cockpit instruments um, that were broadly known as Montre de Ronef. And so in 2012, one of the most meaningful and enduring decisions made by jean frederic Dufour during his term as the leader of Zenith before he departed to Rolex to become director general. But in 2012, he brought back the pilot's watches, and he brought them back in a fashion that's evocative of the Zenith pilot's watches of the 1930s. This one in 40 millimeters is probably the best sized and best proportioned of them because they get downright colossal, especially with the 
pocket watch movements that were installed in some of the originals. So you can see here that the watch has a lovely dial, as Brian mentions, of blue sunburst metallic. If you get closer though, you can see that the individual numerals are solid blocks of Luminova, which creates a wonderful three-dimensional effect, as this isn't actually a printed dial, it's applique blocks, and then it has three-dimensional loom, which is super cool at night. Inside there is a 50-hour automatic Zenith Caliber 679. You can see the Blario monoplane on the back, and the reverse side of the case is made of titanium, so it's hypoallergenic and very, very light. It's also 100 meters water resistant, which is uncommon for pilot's watches. They tend to be about 30 meters. And then you can see, as with many vintage Zenith instruments, within and without the cockpit, there is individual numbering on the side with a bolt fixed plate. And if you look closely, you can see the bolts are nicely burnished for an aged effect. So this is a real cool piece. The strap is what Zenith terms oily nubuck. Don't worry, it's not going to leave a stain. It just means it has a lovely velvety feel, as Brian mentions, and then there's rubber underneath to separate the moisture and oil of your wrist from the strap for long-wearing durability. So, and the watch didn't originally come out in 40 millimeters. It came no. out in a larger size. And I would suffice to say that it was in response to the success of the Big Pilot. Yes. At a much better price point. And you know, we, we take for granted how long the IWC Big Pilot has, has been around, but there was a period in time in which it was gangbusters. And this watch was a, let's see, a direct launch to compete against that particular piece at a much better price point. And you mm -hmm. can see how the line has evolved over time. And you can also see how the trend for smaller watches has come into play because, you know, let's face it, watches are trending down. A big pilot nowadays is an exceptionally large watch. And you can see the fact that they're producing 40 millimeter pilot's watches show that a lot of consumers want that same pilot look, but at an easier uh, to wear case size. Definitely, and Zenith is not actually copying IWC or anyone with this watch. Zenith has a real aviation heritage. Mm -hmm. This watch draws directly on their own heritage of design. It's not a big pilot wannabe. Before the 1940 Luftwaffe B-Ur, the watch that inspired the big pilot's watch, Zenith had already been in aviation for decades. So this is not a, a Me Too watch or an attempt to ride on the coattails of the, the B-Ur trend that emerged with the big pilot. This is very much Zenith's own watch inside and out. It's their design, it's their history, and most importantly, it is their movement as there's a Zenith Elite 679 in there. And if you've ever wondered how you can know, because I know some of the Zenith Pilot watches were built with Salida movements, if you see something like Caliber 3000 in the reference number, you know that's Salida. That was discontinued. Zenith took the feedback to heart and they discontinued those, but they're still out there. Some people see extra special on the dial and they have questions, but the reference number of the watch will include the movement. And this one includes 679 right in the middle there. And that's how you know. Okay. Well, we're ending with a bang. Or a gong. <laughs> it's the gong show. We're finishing up with a minute repeater. And in case you guys were wondering, I don't know if I mentioned it, but today's theme is automatic winding. And that's the, exactly... The topics are getting broader and broader. I love it. You know, that's the thing. It could be almost anything. I mean, it could be literally anything from a... Space Invaders Romagerome to a Patek Philippe 5033P, which is what we have right here. And this is a Gondolo annual calendar minute repeater. It was the first time those two complications were ever combined. In the early 1990s, Patek Philippe established the Gondolo line, inspired by the Chronometro Gondolo of the first third of the 20th century. And these are form cases tonneaus, squares, and cushion cases. This watch is 38 millimeters wide by 51 millimeters in platinum, and it came out in 2002, combining the 1996 annual calendar innovation from Patek Philippe with the company's traditional strength in chiming watches. So you get the guilloche dial. This is the second generation dial after the original Roman numeral dial. And built from 2002 to 2012, fewer than 80 of these were constructed, which is to say this is an extraordinarily rare watch. Throw it on the wrist, it's also a large watch. Although 38 might not sound large, form watches always wear larger. Brian, maybe you could share some thoughts on that, just how a 38 as a cushion case is never really a 38. And so it's no different than the, you know, the Royal Oak feels larger than it is. The, Naut you know, the Nautilus can either feel smaller or larger than it is, depending upon what millimeter size they're, they're giving towards it over time. You know, the watch itself, you know, it fits the length of your wrist. 
And for many, not this, you know, I would say not this one, you know, considering the, the complication, but the more standard just annual calendar version of the watch was the large annual calendar if you wanted a, if you wanted a bigger piece. So if you wanted a, a, an annual calendar from Patek Philippe and the 5146 was a little bit too small, you were buying the 5135. Now, they've since come out with the 5905, which is a 42 millimeter platinum annual calendar chronograph in order to fulfill that need. And, you know, they had discontinued this version of the watch uh, a little bit before then. So, you know, as you'd said, the millimeter can very often be misleading and not necessarily fit that way. Now, this is the R27 and it is the Petite second, and it is the QA, Contium Annual. It uses that calendar that need to be adjusted only once per year during the jump from February to March, and it combines it with a micro rotor automatic architecture. Now, everything about this watch, from the finish to the specification, 483 parts, it is the best available. It holds up under a microscope, but you don't need to get that close to appreciate the best feature of this watch, which is not the sight, but the sound. By the way, take a look at how deeply ridged those Cote de Genève are. You look at some watches and the Cote de Genève are just weak silvery waves. They're the same color all the way across. Real deep ridged wheel driven Cote de Genève laid down by abrasive. They look like this. As I said, no compromise here from the guilloche of the rotor to the coat on the bridges. It's the best available. Now I'm going to show you how this watch works. I'm going to fire it up and I have a pretty good track record of hitting 1259 with minute repeaters and that is what you want to set if you really want to impress your friends with your minute repeater and if you own a Patek Philippe 5033 you will want to impress your friends. So let's see if I can hit the mark one more time. If you go too far you get one ding and that's one o'clock. Let's do that one more time right up against the mic. As good as it gets, guys. Best in the business. And remember, these watches made after 2009 featured the Patek Philippe seal. Prior to the Poisson de Genève, this is one of the earlier and more desirable Geneva Hallmark models. And you can see the Geneva stamp right on the balance cock. As good as it gets, guys. Finish, spec, exclusivity, importance, collectability. And, it, and you know, and I would say that, sorry to cut you no, off. No, no, please. But that Patek Philippe truly is the best in the business when it comes to minute repeaters. And they view the minute repeater as the ultimate complication. And it really is. I think it, it requires the most nuance, the most level of precision. And just the fact that every single one sounds different and that it truly is um, artistry to get it to sound perfect. That's a fact. Every single one has personality, not just different metals, but different individual units. They are all artisanally crafted. You know, there are a lot of watches made today, even by Patek, that can be described as assembled pieces. The components are all regular, mass-produced. They go together. It's the same every time. It's very consistent. Minute repeaters are never like that. Minute repeaters are like single-barrel bourbon, always done well by experts, but different from batch to batch, and that's part of their beauty. They're very human. Yeah, so great selection. You know, one thing that I wanted to chime in on, to the commenter from last week in Philadelphia, we say glashoot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna stick with that. <laughs> That's the story, we're sticking with it. Time out, Tim out, Brian out, and thanks for logging on. <laughs>